And uh, our first speaker will be Jonathan Leach. Let me say a few words about him. He did his undergraduate work at the University of Manchester. He w moved to Glasgow, where he did his master's and PhD at the University of Glasgow. He's worked in a number of different things in um, this area of science, integrating optical trapping and microfluidics for ultra-sensitive sensors. He's gained industrial experience by working at Lumerical, and he worked here in Ottawa for a few years. In fact, that's where I met him in first. And actually, he's the person that introduced me into um, more complex beam structures and did the first experiment that I've ever done in this area in my laboratory. So let me just add that personal experience but with Jonathan. He's really good in the lab, really, really good. Um, in the autumn of 2012, he joined Harriet Watt University to establish a research program in experimental quantum optics. His research interests are applying classical and quantum optics techniques to solve problems in, in, uh, of inter information science, nanophotonics, optical sensing, and computational imaging. And of course, the work he's going to talk about today, I believe, and that is on imaging in very, very low light levels. It's called Imaging at the Speed of Light. I think you'll be very impressed. Jonathan. Thank you very much. Can I just check if this microphone is on? No. Okay, I'll just look at it. Th thank you very much, Paul. Um, I was just talking with uh, Bob at lunchtime. I can't believe it. It's 12 years since Bob came to Ottawa. Um, I joined Bob uh, three months after the, the program started. I was the second person to, to join Bob's group after Sangeeta. And uh, we were over in the site building. Uh, and there was, a, there was a saga about bringing optical tables up a level and into the site building. But we did our first experiments there. And I can't tell you how things have changed. And Ibrahim was just telling me about their successful grant moving forward uh, and how they're they're building new beam lines in, 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 in ARC. And it is just amazing to see the progress in, in 12 years from the, the humble beginnings. Um, so yeah, just before I start my talk, these are the two papers that I think I, I guess, most famous with collaborating with, with the groups here. So I, we did an experiment with, with Bob and Miles, which was the showing OAM in, um, entanglement, and then that, this is the paper that uh, Paul uh, just referred to, which was creating high harmonic beams with controlled orbital angular momentum. And um, those are, well, we started that process 10, 12 years ago. But actually, I think this is my first experience collaborating with the uh, photonics program here. And this is when Ibrahim came to visit Miles in Glasgow, and I remember vividly sitting with Ibrahim controlling um, Q plates and SLMs and Ibrahim telling me what to do. And things probably haven't changed for the people in his lab. <laughs> um, I, I put this one up because this is my favorite paper, I think, of our collaboration with Bob. Um, I have a phrase which I tell my group, which is don't be perfect, you should be reassuringly scientific. Uh, and the reassuringly scientific, for anyone that's from the UK, comes from uh, Stella Artois and their advertising campaign, which said that their beer was reassuringly expensive. Um, and I'll show you what I mean by reassuringly scientific. If you go back to the, the results in, in, in Jim Viev's paper, like Paul's paper, the creating high harmonic beams, the result, results are not perfect at all. They, 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 they show the effect that we were trying to show, and it's a beautiful experiment proposed by Bob and, and Paul, but by no means are they perfect. And I think that there's something very, I, I don't know, endearing about our community where we don't have to be perfect to be able to do good science. And I, I tell my students that moving forward. Okay, uh, moving on to today, there are five topics that I'd like to talk about. Light and flight, high-speed imaging, 3D pose measurements, 
modeling SPAD arrays and then onto quantum measurements. These all are roughly tied together with new technology in single photon detection and specifically single photon detector arrays. And part of my research program in the UK as part of our contribution to the UK technology program has to be develop these new exciting detectors pushing the boundaries of them scientifically but also pushing the applied um, applications of these and I'll allude to our research here. So first of all, light and flight. Um, this is what these SPAD cameras look like when you put a metal box and a lens around them. They look like any other camera. But there's two very special things about these cameras. They have the, a temporal resolution of tens of picoseconds, and they have single, single photon sensitivity, which gives you the ability to measure light as it propagates. Okay, you can do LIDAR measurements with them as well. And this is one of the first experiments that we did in our lab. This is uh, together with Daniele Faccio. This is um, single photon sensitive light and flight imaging. And we were able to capture the path of a pulse of light as it propagated in our lab. Um, this is Rayleigh scattering off of molecules, air, uh, nitrogen air and um, oxygen molecules, if I can play this again. What, what's really happening here is, is the, the, the light is, is going transverse to the camera. Some of the photons scatter off the air molecules and they arrive at the camera. I think it's a, a fantastic illustration of the capabilities of these sensors. And this is how it works. So we have our camera and our laser source and we have our mirrors and we've got our pulses of light that are bouncing around uh, through free space. And some of those photons scatter off air molecules and head towards the camera. Meanwhile, we have a trigger going from the laser to the camera, which tells the stopwatches and all of the, cam on, on all of the pixels to start. So they all tick, and then when a photon arrives, they stop. And what we're playing to you back is the arrival time as measured by each of the pixels, and each of the pixels looks at a different point in space and therefore has a different arrival time. You can observe nonlinear effects. So this is super continuum generation inside a fiber. This is a, a delivery sc uh, scattering media inside this fiber so that we were able to see some of the light that comes back, but you can actually see the pulse of light changing as it moves through the fiber. Uh, notice the time scale here. Now, obviously, to achieve this result, you have to put colored filters in front of the camera and do sequential measurements. But after recording RGB, you can put that together and you can actually see the evolution of the pulse inside the fiber. This is cool. Um, this is with a gigahertz laser. A gigahertz laser, if you convert to time, corresponds to one nanosecond. Everyone's told in high school that light travels one foot in one nanosecond. Uh, slightly different when it's inside fiber, taking account the refractive index. But those pulses are essentially separated by uh, one nanosecond in time. It's a gigahertz laser. So that's what a gigahertz laser looks like as it's moving around inside a fiber. Now, you may comment, oh, uh, you know, isn't the pulse length of your laser much shorter than what we're obser observing in this case here? And that is true. The downside to the electrical way that the cameras um, record the, 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 the photon arrival times is that there's some uncertainty associated with the arrival time of order hundreds of picoseconds, which blurs what would be a much narrower pulse in, in reality. Anyway, I think it's cool. Now, the most recent work that we've done in, on this, uh, this is a classic case of uh, had a great idea, did the experiment, wrote up the paper and realized that other people beat you to it. Uh, I'm sure that's happened to almost everyone in this audience. Um, but you can not only do um, uh, transverse to the plane of the the, the imaging plane, you can record three-dimensional light propagation. So 
Light obviously is able to move around in three dimensions, and in three dimensions it might look like this. You might have a scattering event at one point there, and another scattering event point there, with the light, in this case, moving towards the camera. And there's some really interesting effects that happen in, in this case when you have the light moving towards the camera. Oh, verifying. Notice here that these two spherical waves actually would hit the sensor at close to the same time. However, the pulse has moved quite a long distance. So this appears at the camera as a relativistic effect. It's not relativistic, but it appears because the time that the camera pixels record is very similar for the photon arrivals. So what the camera data looks like, you're going to see a flash here. All pixels light up at approximately the same time rather than light propagating across the field of view. And we can interpret that as um, light traveling, like a, a relativistic effect. So in the case that light is moving towards the camera, when you convert what, you know, the, the known distance that the light has traveled transverse, but you take into account the time that the camera is recorded and convert that to apparent velocity, you get an order of magnitude, well, a, around an order of magnitude increase compared to C. And the reverse happens when light moves away from the camera. And we get slower than the speed of light. And there's about a 300 times difference between the fastest and the slowest that we were able to record, which is quite a, a large variation. Now, obviously, with that knowledge, you can compensate for that. And if you compensate for that, you're able to reconstruct the path of the light in three dimensions. Okay, So you either are left with full reconstruction in 3D or something that looks like it has um, relativistic effects. OK. This exact same technology inside this, this, this camera here is exactly the latest generation of what's used for three-dimensional imaging, where you would illuminate a target with a pulse light and then record the scattered light back from the target. And because we have a pulse source, you're able to record in three dimensions. So this is LIDAR. Um, this is my student, Max, uh, recorded in 3D on the left with one of these cameras. And he was at a distance of 50 meters away and illuminated with the light. And you can see on the left you, the three dimensions. On the right, this is just an image recorded with a video camera. And this absolutely comes into what I would quantify as reassuringly scientific data. The, the data on the left is not perfect, but it's good enough that you can see that there's a person there. Uh, and I'll talk about methods that we've developed recently about improving the quality of the data on the left. In terms of the um, resolution that we can get, we can get sim uh, you know, quite easily centimeter resolution. But you can see there it's quite difficult to resolve any fingers in that. Okay, so you, you, you've got sort of centimeter spatial resolution for, for, for this, and then also centimeter uh, depth resolution as well. The work that we, we, we did recently on this was on high speed um, imaging. High speed imaging is relevant for. Things that are changing rapidly, it's especially relevant for things like crash testing. We have not reached quite the limit for the automotive industry in terms of the frame rate that they require. That in the UK is 10, uh, 10, yeah, 10,000 frames per second for uh, the automotive industry to be engaged. Here we're at 1,000 frames a second. So if you've got a camera that runs 1,000 frames a second in 3D, what do you do? You, you go out, you get a hammer, and you smash an apple. Uh, so this is uh, us re re um, having fun in the lab here. This is at 1,000 frames a second. We're actually, in this case here, showing you both 
the intensity and the depth information. The intensity is overlaid on top of the depth information. Here's my colleague Istvan juggling in 3D, and this is recorded at 1,000 frames a second. The, the camera technology is, is really advanced. It will do alternate intensity images and then depth images at 500 hertz. So it has interlaced intensity, then depth, intensity, then depth, both of those going at, uh, at yeah, you dropped it there, at, at 500 hertz, and the combination gives us 1,000 hertz. Then we can use the intensity information, which is from a technical reason at a higher resolution, higher spatial resolution, and use that to guide the upsampling of our spatial, of, of the depth information. You can even go further than that. You can analyze the data that comes from these sensors and do tracking. Um, so you're gonna see at the moment uh, a football being kicked across, okay? And we're able to track and identify objects as those objects move across the field of view. And this is obviously interesting if this technology is used for obstacle avoidance in the automotive industry or ob ob uh, tracking objects in any other scenario. This is my postdoc Fung here and Sterling. Sterling is a DSTL sponsored student. DSTL is the Defense and Security Technology Lab and uh, it's the defense um, science uh, branch of, of the UK government. He's sponsored by them and they're specifically interested in using this technology for tracking and identification of objects at long ranges. And uh, this is us in our corridor using the SPAD sensor here with a telescope, well, uh, not a telescope, just a lens. That's a laser that's shone down the corridor here. And we're using that laser to illuminate a drone at 50 meters and tracking and identifying the orientation of that drone at 50 meters. Now, it turns out that that was actually an incredibly difficult experiment to do for technical reasons which are quite easy to understand. Uh, the features on a drone are essentially the same size as the features on my, f my hand. So if I'm, if I'm ask, wanting to identify what a drone is, is doing, I'm asking can I identify the features on a hand at long ranges, at long distances. Okay, Those are re that's a really challenging task. It's actually very different from identifying a human and identifying what a human is doing because a human is a much larger object than, than, than a drone. So this is what the data looks like when you, when you take it from the, from the camera, okay? The, the drone on the left in the intensity image, you can see the drone flying around, but in the depth image, it turns out, I'm not sure if we've reached the reassuringly scientific criteria yet on, on the right-hand side. You can see something moving around, um, but we're not quite there yet. And this really pushed us to understand the limitations that these sensors have. Okay, and I'm gonna come on to that in one of our, the, the, the future topics that I'm gonna talk about. But these te this technology is, is fantastic, but it has its limitations. Um, you do have to record light coming back to the sensor. And in the regime of high-speed imaging, very few photons can come back in certain scenarios. So I want to take a bit of time to talk about this 3D, 3D pose work that we've done. I think that this is really exciting work. I think we've really shown the combination here of the technology and the hardware and the computational imaging side of things to do something which I think is really special and I think there's lots of applications of this moving forward. So if anyone has um, a Samsung phone, especially I think the S20, I'm sure, I know for sure has this, 
you will have a SPAD sensor in it. Okay, it's a single photon detector array sensor. And it's used for helping autofocus assist in the dark. So if you're at a party or in a pub and you want to take a photograph, the camera lens needs to know where to focus to. And it gains that information through active illumination and the SPAD tells the sensor, tell, tells the camera where to focus. It's really common. If anyone has an iPhone, the, the, the pro versions have LiDAR sensors in them. Those are Sony sensors. Those sensors, in addition to the, these ones here, are also used for augmented reality. So if you want to uh, chase Pokemon around, that experience is enhanced if your camera knows the three-dimensional layout of where objects are around you. The cost of this sensor here is only around a dollar, a US dollar, okay? You can, you can actually buy this whole package here for around 50 UK pounds as a test, uh, test package. So for 50 pounds, you can, you can do time of flight measurements. Inside that, that black box up there, you have a pulse laser at 940 nanometers, and you have all of the counting electronics to record um, time of flight measurements up to centimeter precisions. So it's very practical, it's very cheap, but unfortunately, for cost reasons, it's manufactured with very low spatial resolution. And in this case, it only has four pixels, uh, four by four pixels. It's, it's a 16 pixel array. Now, why, why, would, why would that matter? Why, does that matter to, to Samsung who are selling this or, or buying this from ST and, and passing it to you? No, because if you're trying to focus on a person, a person is probably you know, less or, or, you know, a person is, fills one of those pixels, right? So it doesn't actually matter that it's only four by four. We're only looking for the distance to the closest target. But we set out trying to increase the resolution of that sensor, that four by four sensor, um, using computational methods and, uh, and training an algorithm to, to do that. So this is an overview of what we were, were trying to do. We had people illuminated by the sensor. Its range is around three meters, okay? That's limited by there's no focusing lens on the front of the sensor and the, the power of the laser to make it eye safe. And if we were to interpret the, the four by four return signal as the depth map, we would be left with this type of image on the right-hand side. So this is the apparent return for our four by four resolution. However, the, the story is more complicated than this. What we get is actually a four by four array of histograms of arrival times. We don't just have the maximum return, we've got the returns of all possible things that that, that pixel is illuminating or looking at. So if I'm looking at two people, then I'll see two peaks in my histogram in that particular pixel. Now that information is thrown away on the graphic on the left, but you can use that information to record and generate a higher resolution image. So we came up with a, a network called, which we called Pixels to Pose, and the goal is to take the temporal and spatial data, this data here, the 16 by 16, it's also it, sorry, this four by four uh, it has 100 temporal bins, so it's four by four by 100, and convert it into much more useful information, which is high resolution depth and 3D pose. We also retrospectively came up with an explanation framework uh, to, to explain how our network interprets our data. So this is, this is the results. I want to just, I want to draw your attention to, to B at the top, which is the four by four initial highest return, and compare that to the uh, E, which is the output of our first 
network. So if I play this here, we can convert the data, which is only four by four pixels, into this depth here. And I think that's quite amazing that we can go from that. The, the, the reality, the true story, is that we're actually going from A, which is the histogram data, down to E. The reference at the top, that's just for your illustration, OK? That C and D, the reference, they're not used in the reconstruction at all. They were used uh, in, in the training of this algorithm. But we can go from B to E. We can further go um, from E to the pose of the person, and then we can get the pose in three dimensions. Going from F to E used a, a, an, an algorithm called open pose, which takes an intensity image of a, a, a person and then returns the, the skeleton of them. So it works in one, for one person. It also works for two people. Actually, this is the three people results. OK, so we've got the highest return B again. And we can get back something that's much more convincing. OK, so that's great. We have a, a system that takes 4 by 4 pixels, 4 by 4 by 100, and turns it into data that's much higher resolution. OK, but that's a bit of a black box. We came up with a network pixels to depth, and it takes this, this 4 by 4 by 100 on the right-hand side, converts it into that image on, on the left. OK, but it's a black box. I haven't yet given you any information about why it works or how the network interprets that data, how good is the data in certain, the, the network in certain scenarios. And there's an entire um, community that looks at something called explainable AI, which is explainable artificial intelligence, which seeks to give the confidence behind neural networks and understand how those work. OK, so the, the first thing that we need to do in explaining our data is to find a different representation rather than 4 by 4 by 100 over here. And what we do is we fit Gaussians to that with a position, a width, and an amplitude. Those are easier to interpret than some waveform. Okay? And we pass this now through our network. Okay? Um, what we want to do is use the position, the width, and the amplitudes as the parameters of an, an easily interpretable local model. OK, so I'll try to explain the idea of this local model in not this, these terms here. One can imagine, you can imagine for, for the moment, that there is a, a program that predicts house prices wherever you are in Canada. OK, and that program takes in all of the parameters of your house price. Oh, sorry, of your house. So it has the square footage, it has the location, it has the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, it has the size of your garage, it has the size of your yard, it has all of the, the parameters that you could put in. Okay? You put that in, and out comes a single number, which is the prediction of that house. Okay? So that's a network that we could imagine exists. Now, that's very difficult to interpret what we want to know is what's the value of the bedrooms, or what's the value of the, gar the size of the garden. So on a, on, a, on a scale of Canada, we can't do that. But let's say we go Ottawa. Okay, still quite difficult to do on the scale of Ottawa. Okay, so let's do like the area around Ottawa. Okay, so let's do Sandy Hill. Okay. 
I picked Sandy Hill because that's the area I know is around here, <laughs> okay? But the, the, the houses in Sandy Hill are, are all similar-ish, okay? So what we've done is we've reduced the number of um, houses to a local area, and what we can now do is find a, local, a linear model, which is a linear combination of our parameters that explains the behavior in Sandy Hill. And what we'll find is that the house prices, house prices in Sandy Hill can be predicted by this model, where it is a linear model, AX is equal to B, where the house price is a linear combination of your input parameters. And what we're trying to do in our case here is find a linear model that takes the position, the width, and the amplitudes and turns that into our output. Now, we can't do that for all possible outputs of our model, like we can't do that for all areas in Canada. We have to, look, we have to narrow down to Sandy Hill. So what we do in our case is we narrow down to this particular solution, and we want to find out the influence of the parameters, the position, the width, and the amplitude, on that particular model. And we do this uh, in a in, with, a, with a linear model. So we, what we do is we have our position, our width, and our amplitude for each of the 16 pixels. That becomes a matrix A, and we want to find out how those are combined to give B, which is our solution, okay? And this is how good they, they can be, okay? So we can, our linear model, okay, is that good at explaining that particular solution. But we can now examine the, the different, the individual contributions of each of the parameters. We can look at this particular pixel and the, the influence of that, the width of that particular pixel. So it's a really powerful way of examining this, okay? And when you look at one particular parameter and one particular pixel's parameters, you can identify the contribution of that particular pixel on the final outcome, okay? And these are just the contributions of that particular pixel on the output plotted at the top. The cool thing here is that we find that the influence of the amplitudes of our peaks controls the edges of the pixels of the person, whereas the positions controls both the body and the edges. And the width doesn't actually affect things too much. Okay. So, why I think this this method of 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 taking taking this uh, this data this this three dimensional data this x y and and z data the four by four by one hundred histogram is is important is because there are many other systems for example, radar and sonar, that produce similar types of data. And our new projects are on applying that type of algorithm to radar data to increase the resolution of radar. Now, radar's extremely good at giving you depth information, but it's really bad at giving you angular resolution, right? Now, what we've shown here is we've got a system that's got really quite good depth resolution, but really bad spatial resolution, and we've improved it. So we're now embarking on a project to apply the same principles to radar. Okay, modeling spat arrays. I, I showed you our data that wasn't quite good enough here. Well, I don't know if not quite good enough is here. It's, it is what it is, okay? Um, we wanted to understand the limitations of our, our system, we wanted to understand how good can these detectors be at generating 
images at depth images. Okay, what are the fundamental limits of this? So what we've done is we've come up with a model. In fact, we like we where you take all of the known parameters, the energy per pulse, the repetition rate, the wavelength of your laser, the pulse width, the range that you're at, the divergence of your beam, the attenuation, all of these things, the properties of your surface that you're reflecting off, the properties of your camera, how that's scattered, and how you then record that with your pixel size, the dark counts, all of this. If you have knowledge of all of those parameters there, you can, in fact, come up with a prediction, and a prediction that's extremely accurate for your uh, depth images. Now, what this does, all of those parameters there, once you know those, once you know those, you essentially define a probability distribution for the return photons. You've got a background, and you've got a signal, and that probability distribution is essentially fixed once these things are fixed here. When the laser fires and we record, what we are doing is sampling that distribution so many times. And we can improve the quality of our data by changing the underlying probability distribution and making that more favorable and gaining more information per photon, or recording more times and recording more events and then gaining more information that way. So the kramer rao bound is the limit in sampling theorem of how good you can get to the estimation of a parameter given an underlying probability distribution and given the number of times that you sampled it. And given that we know our probability distribution for every single pixel, and we know how many times we've sampled, we can very, very rapidly generate synthetic images of what these cameras are going to observe. The alternative approach is actually you can go, well, I know my probability distribution, and I'm going to just numerically simulate many, many thousands of laser pulses and generate histograms. And from those histograms, I'm going to calculate my depths. Okay, so we've got two approaches which we can compare to experimental procedures. The one on the right here, this histograms to depths, that actually takes a little bit of time to do. We have got to run multiple samples. But the one on the left, you can generate frames at ex extremely high rates. And here we go. This is, this is the power of having um, good signal to noise in such a system. All I've done on the image on the left is increased the signal to noise by about a factor of 10 compared to the one on the right. And we're sampling. You can see the number of photons that we have to sample on the left compared to the number of samples that we have to number of photons on the right. So this is why designing our optical systems to have high signal to noise is crucially important because it allows us to get lots of information per photon. Now, it's not to say that we wouldn't be able to estimate this peak. We just have to sample many, many, many times. And what that does is slow down the potential frame rate that these systems can operate so th this is the kramer rao bound. I don't have many formulas in my presentation. But what this says is that the, the best estimate of the, the peak position there cannot be greater than 1 over the square root of the, efficient, the number of times I've sampled that distribution. And I is the Fisher information. And that's the information every time I, I sample my distribution. What you're trying to get is I to be as large as possible and N to be as large as possible. And when we do this on a, this, this is a real, like, real data that we, we, we've, um, this is, we, we built this depth target here. And these are simulated depth movies of what looking at this depth target would look like 
for a particular configuration at 1,110 images per second. And this data we can generate very, very rapidly. This corresponds very well to the, the experimental data that we've achieved. We actually went further, actually I'll go to this. We went further and we recorded a car at 1.4 kilometers um, and we predicted what that car would look like. So this is the, the, the picture at the bottom. This is the, the prediction at the top. So experimental at the bottom. Uh, the prediction from our model at the top. On the left is a sum of all of the, uh, is a histogram of all of the results. I don't know what you guys think. I'll take comments from our people afterwards. We submitted this um, and the editor rejected the paper on the basis that this wasn't a good um, uh, a good enough agreement. I was quite surprised because I thought that that would be, oh, it was a good agreement, but maybe it's just, you know, it's in the reassuringly scientific um, category, not the, the very good. But what, you, what I think this confirms to me is that given knowledge of my system parameters, I can go out and predict how well one of these systems is going to uh, behave in pretty much any scenario. Uh, here, this is a, a, a movie that my Ster student Sterling produced uh, under different illuminations. The, the ground truth is at the top left. This is, you can read it. This is an F2 lens, uh, and this is an F4 lens here. Interestingly, you do gain uh, from the F2 lens over the F4 lens, but it's a, not a significant improvement. Okay. Now, the last topic I want to talk about, I'm going to change, uh, change, change sort of uh, to, to something that is closer to home for the, the people here and closer to home for what I uh, was doing whilst I was in Ottawa. So these are quantum state measurements. I think um, one of the, I, I, I truly believe this. I, Bob, I, I'll, I'll take a break from talking about this. I'll tell you a, a story, which is my favorite Bob story. And everyone has their own favorite Bob stories. Um, but I remember sitting in the site building with the students, and Bob came in, and we were looking at some of the results, and, and we were having a conversation. And the conversation was along the lines of, why do you like physics? What is, it, what is it about physics that you enjoy? And one of the students said, well, I like physics because like, I know what the answer is, right? And I think, you know, Many of us got into physics because, you know, there were certain, you know, you, you knew that you were right when you got something right, okay? In a, certainly in an exam. And I said, I like physics, and I still think this, I like physics because I can learn one thing and I can apply it to a range of different um, applications. And the best example of that, I think, is the Fourier transform. Fourier transform is one of the most beautiful pieces of maths that you can apply in so many different uh, areas of physics. And then Bob said... I like working with people. And I just thought to myself, wow, okay? And I've always held on to Bob saying, I like working with people as what kept him interested in physics. And working with people is the core of what he wants to do, okay? And I say that story now because the last author on this, uh, Anand, is, um, is, is one of Bob's graduate students from when he was in Rochester. And that would have been 15 years ago. Bob, 15? And, and Girish is one of Anand's graduate students. And to this day, Bob has, to his absolute credit, has created a community that wants to work with each other in the future. And I was talking in the lab yesterday and just saying how much I appreciate working with Anand and how great it is. And I work very closely in, in Ottawa, sorry, I work very closely with, in, in Harriet Watt, with Mehul Malik, who is again another one of Bob's graduate students. So we, Anand, Anand uh, phoned me or emailed me and then we spoke and he, he said, we're trying to do this experiment and it's not working, why? And I said, well, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and explained why he was doing it wrong, and we ended up getting it working. But the core idea is really, I think, really elegant. The core idea 
is to look at the difference between the correlations that exist in the position degree of freedom compared to the angular position degree of freedom. So this is transverse position and angular position. Okay, so A refers to the, I've measured a photon in a two photon state at this location, where is the other photon on the, 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 the idler photon? And in B, I've measured at this particular angle and where's the, the angle on the, for the other photon? Now, the question is what happens to these correlations as I propagate and move away from the crystal, okay? And if you plot the transverse position correlations as you move away from the crystal, you get um, this type of correlation here. So at the crystal plane, you can see that you're correlated, right? Now that's because the two photons were born at the same location. But as they move away, they clearly, they separate and they, they're no longer correlated. In fact, in the far field, well, as, as I move, it's not the far field. As those, those fo photons move away, their positions become anti-correlated. One's here and one's over there, okay? And, and that on the right-hand side up here is what you get. Okay, that's what you get for the position degree of freedom. But it's quite different for the angular position. So for the angular position case, the two photons start in the same location, at the start at the same angle, but as they move away, you find them at 180 degrees apart. Okay, and they start correlated here, and they're then 180 degrees apart. They're still correlated in the sense that if one's at six o'clock, then the other one's down at 12 o'clock, and if one moves around here, then the other one's gonna be around there. But they, they move through this location in the middle where there's absolutely no correlation at all. And Anand wanted to experimentally observe this. So why is, why is this relevant? Well, if I look at the, how the, the X correlations move, they only get worse as I move away from the, the crystals. But the angular correlations, they get better. That's not my phone. And when it comes to the implications for the EPR power, wow. <laughs> when it comes to the, the, the implications for the, the EPR paradox, what this means is that if you look at the position momentum degree of freedom, as I move away from the crystal, the X correlations get worse and worse, and I lose the ability to measure the entanglement. Whereas if I look at OAM and, and the angular correlations, sure, they get worse as I move away from the crystal, but actually, it comes back. Now, I don't want to suggest that the entanglement ever disappears. It's just the case that you weren't able to measure it. And in the case where you're measuring in the OAM angle degree of freedom, the correlations come back. And as I propagate away from the crystal, you're able to record uh, the entanglement. Okay. The other paper that I want to talk about here is, is high dimensional entanglement robust to noise. A couple of years ago, there was quite a lot of, I mean, there still is quite a lot of excitement about these states being robust to, to noise and whether or not high dimensional entanglement in particular has any special property that allows it to be, uh, have advantages. Now, often when we write down the, the quantum state, we approximate it as some proportion of the state that we have, the entanglement, plus some proportion of noise. The identity here relates to just uncorrelated noise, okay? And, and the paper that I uh, spoke to you about before, 
I, I said it was my favorite paper that I did with, with Bob, is this one, Tomography of the Quantum State of Photons Entangled in High Dimensions. And this, is, this paper, I think, is great in many ways, but one of the ways that it's great is that it's imperfect. And it's actually cited as one of, as an inefficient way of recording the, the quantum state. And if you look at the set of measurements that we did in that experiment, for, I think this is for five dimensions, this is something like 340 measurements that we had to do to reconstruct this quantum state. And that gives us that row absolutely perfectly. And people now cite this work as this is, you know, uh, Agnew et al. Uh, didn't do this quite as well as they should have, and we've done it better. <laughs> so, so there's another lesson there, I guess. Um, but in, in the work that we've got, that we did about high dimensional entanglement being robust to noise, what I wanted to do was work out, can we estimate that P, that fraction of our entangled state with as few measurements as possible? And it turns out that that P can be very, very quickly related to just a few measurements. And that quantity Q in this case is just the signal to noise ratio of your correlation matrix here. So anyone that goes to the lab and measures correlations will know that you need to have some high signal to noise, okay? The, the, the diagonal has to be larger than the off diagonal. That ratio, that ratio of the diagonal to the off diagonal is what we call Q here. And if you approximate it to be constant for all measurements, for all, all outcomes here, then you can extremely rapidly measure or estimate what P is. And I think that's an extremely powerful way of approximating what your quantum state is with very, very few measurements. You can, in fact, um, look at Bell's inequalities as a function of this Q. You can look at EPR criteria as a function of this Q. You can look at steering equalities as a function of that Q. And you can very rapidly predict how any quantum system in any number of dimensions is going to operate with only knowledge of your signal to noise parameter. OK, in the last, uh, last five minutes, I want to talk about sorting states. And I noticed that uh, one of Jeff's students has a similar poster. Uh, to this using an, an MPLC. So sorting states, um, if I give you this question here, how do I sort the H and V polarization states of light? Well, that's not a very difficult question. The answer is a polarizing beam slitter. Happy days. What if I said, how do I sort H and D? That's not as easy, okay? I don't, those two states are not orthogonal to each other. That poses challenges. In fact, we can solve that problem by adding in an additional outcome where it corresponds to un some uncertainty about the measurement outcome. So you can actually define a system that goes click for H, click for D, and click for I don't know. And the amount of I don't know really relates to the overlap of your two initial states. So if you were H and V, then the I don't know can be zero. If you were horizontal and horizontal rotated a tiny little bit, then that, that click there has to be quite high. And we wanted to do this in, oh, sorry. You, 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 in the extreme cases, you've got two options. A system that's accurate, it never makes a mistake, but it doesn't give you an answer 100% of the time. That's called unambiguous state discrimination. Or you can have a system that makes mistakes, but it all gives you an answer. And we were going for this system here. And uh, we were doing it on the back of the, the great work from Joel Carpenter and Nicholas Fontaine that, sh that used multi-plane light converters for multi-outcome measurements of uh, spatial states of light. So this is a paper uh, from three years ago, two, yeah, three years ago now. It's got actually hundreds of citations now. It's, it's, going, it's got incredible citation metrics. And they were able to sort um, many, many OAM states of light using their sorter. 
These are the states that we wanted to sort. These are superpositions of Harmat Gaussian modes. These are non orthogonal states of uh, spatial states of light. We've got one more output than input, and we want to sort those states to pos positions on a camera that you can record. Notice in each case there's a question mark. And the optical component, rather than a beam, being a beam splitter in this case, looks something like this. This is a spatial light modulator with multiple bounces um, off, of, uh, off a mirror. It's quite a nice picture, not only because you can see the loss in efficiency of the spatial light modulator as that red light is bouncing across. That's a spatial light modulator for a longer wavelength, so uh, we were losing light uh, as it was bouncing. Uh, it looks like this. We come in with different modes. Those modes bounce along here, and you can see the outputs. Uh, if the blue mode, blue is just used to show one particular mode, we're going to get a click at three or question mark. Green is going to give us a click at two or question mark, and one is going to give us a, a click at one or question mark. And if I was to put all of the modes in together at the same time, they would propagate through and look like this here, where all of the modes would appear at a particular outcome, and the white mode there corresponds to a probability that I've got red, blue, or green mode appearing. These are the experimental results. When you have um, set for seven dimensions, the f is equal to zero corresponds to all modes being orthogonal with respect to each other. We can see that we can sort those states almost perfectly. When we start to increase the overlap of the states with respect to each other, then the, uns the question mark mode starts to increase. The question mark mode is the one on the right-hand side. And that gets higher and higher probability as we increase the overlap of our states. And it works very well with respect to the theory. Uh, final result that I want to show is it also works for images. Images are an example of non-orthogonal states. So we tried, uh, we, we designed an MPLC for these three input states, so smiley face, sad face, and uh, frowning, or, or whatever, I don't know what the, the one on the right is. Um, and here are the outputs. You can see that when we put the smiley face in, we get a click at smiley face or question mark, and it works for the other two options as well. That's the, 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 the quality of the results there. And it's at the 97% says that we're 97% confident that the particular image that we record was the input. Uh, so finally, I'd just like to thank the graduate students that did the work. Imogen was the one that was doing the light and flight. Herman was the high speed imaging. Alice is the one that's done the 3D was the modeling and the SPAD arrays. Max was the one on the quantum state measurements. And Fung is the postdoc that's done the supervision of all of the work. I'd like to thank the sponsors, DSTL, Quantic, and EPSRC. And I'd also like to thank you guys for your attention. Thank you very much. Really excellent talk, Jonathan. Um, I have a question about the experiment on uh, the revival of entanglement in the OAM and angle bases. So you showed that the transverse position momentum entanglement um, actually degrades as a function of z. But in the angle OAM basis, you actually recover it uh, after a certain uh, propagation distance. Now, uh, both these entanglements are in the same degree of freedom, which is the transverse spatial degree of freedom. It's just that one of them is in the Cartesian coordinates and the other is in the polar coordinates. So it seems very strange that you lose entanglement in one basis, but you still retain it in the other basis where these two bases are related by a local unitary transformation. Uh, the only 
difference I can see in the angle OAM basis is that you make an, you actually carry out an integration over the radial degree of freedom. So do you have some kind of an intuitive understanding of why you see a stark difference in the behavior here? So that's a, an interesting question. I don't know the answer to this. It would be interesting to perform the integration over the X, over all X or over Y and see if you get similar results. I really want to emphasize, emphasize that it's not that the entanglement is lost, it's just that your measurement system is not capable of recovering it. Uh, right? I see. So, so, so in a sense, if I move away from the crystal, but I know how far away I've moved from the crystal, I can always put lenses in that image me back to the crystal plane. Right. So it's not that the entanglement has been lost. It's just that I don't have an experimental system that's able to accurately measure it and recover it. Okay. I, I don't have an intuition. I, don't, like, I wish I did, because I've kind of thought about the same question myself. Like, you're right. They're both spatial entanglement. Why would angular position behave any different from, from transverse position? I don't know. I'd okay. like to think more about it, but I don't have a simple intuition to give you. Can I have a quick uh, follow-up question to that? Uh, let's see how many we have. Let me give Ilhan first, and oh, then we'll sure. come back. Yeah. Hold on. So, thank you very much, Jonathan. As always, it is amazing listening to you and uh, different directions. So I just want to comment on this. Entanglement, you're totally right. Entanglement is there, but the measurement is not in the proper basis yep. to, perform, to be performed. The lenses does in the two mutual ion by spaces, which is a near field and far field, yep. so that is a discrete Fourier transform of each other. Right. If you have an SLM in any intermediate places, but you have a proper phasing, then you can recover the entanglement. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have some questions about the 3D pose example yeah. where you used the neural networks and you had these nice animations and you showed these reference videos mm -hmm. yeah. and said those were used for training. Yeah. Did you use exactly these videos to train the network for this so, reproduction? Yeah, so the, I, I probably didn't explain that particularly well. There was an entire training phase where what we need to do is we need to capture intensity and depth images from a Kinect camera and compare that to the output of our um, the, 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 the sensor from ST. In the videos that I was showing you, we captured the intensity and the depth with the uh, Microsoft Connect at high resolution just for a reference. Those images were never used for training or reconstruction. They were only used as a reference of what that looked like for those particular cases. Okay, and then also the, the example with the three people was like the identical network as the one with the one person. So, only, so, so no, we no. needed to have three different networks, whether it was one person, two people, oh, or three okay. net, three people. But you could have a, a pre-sorting -sor of that to go to that like one, one, two, or three right. people network. No, we didn't use the same network for each of them. Okay. It okay. was a network trained for a particular number of part people. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. So a quick question about the, your camera. What's the frame rate? And, and if it's comparatively slow, I was wondering if there's an advantage of sending multiple pulses per um, exposure. And then you, don't, you obviously end up with, with an apparent image of at various different distances, but obviously you could play tricks to correct for that and basically send multiple pulses per So you, you, you do end up with range ambiguity in certain cases. Um, the... The triggering rate is very different from the rate at which we can read out the, uh, the data. So the triggering rate can be megahertz or kilohertz. Um, but then you integrate over multiple pulses in a particular single readout, which is of order a, a kilohertz um, or, or less. So, so, so one frame integrates over several pulses, which are triggered at significantly higher rates. Okay. Right. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Jonathan, for the, the talk. Um, I had a question about 
the, the two videos that you had for the drone. So I noticed on the top that there was sort of like a lot of fluctuation in the, the depth measurements. Yep. And I was wondering, is that because of fluctuations in the air? So uh, like, oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it seemed like because of the propellers, it was changing the air there, and then it would change the depth of field, I guess. Could you comment on that? Or? Uh, that's not something that I, I'll, I'll look closely at the video again, maybe we can look at it. If there's, the biggest source of uncertainty is because of low light level return and not having a sufficient data to establish. So if there are areas in that video that have large fluctuations, it's most likely because there were very few photons that were coming back, which is because of lack of illumination. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. So final, uh, final question. Uh, could you go to the slide where you had the comparison between the position momentum and the angle OAM, uh, the conditional Heisenberg product? <coughs> yeah, uh, right here. So uh, in the top right uh, plot there, even the theoretical uh, criterion for the entanglement seems to have a dip um, at some specific Z, like around five centimeters. What's going on there? The top right one, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm gonna have to look. Okay, okay. thanks. Good. Okay. okay. I, I, I think I know, but I'll come back to you, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.